Hi everyone, welcome back to OILS 513 Foundations of Digital Information Management. This week we'll expand upon the information lifecycle model concepts that we learned last time by examining the fields of workflow analysis and business process management. These terms are actually somewhat synonymous, but they represent a field of inquiry that seeks to understand how work is organized and also for our purposes how information is produced in the workplace. We'll look at methods for documenting workflow processes that can be used for management analysis and employee training. We'll also touch on how to experimentally model workflows so that we can identify systemic problems and implement new efficiencies. Have a great week! Hi everyone, welcome back. This is the OILS 513 lecture for Learning Module 4, where we expand upon what we learned about the information lifecycle model concept to gain a more in-depth view of how information is produced in an organizational context. As I mentioned in the introduction online, the information lifecycle model is really meant to be used to give us a high-level overview of how information flows from production to destruction within any organization. And these could include schools, governmental agencies, private businesses, or nonprofit agencies of other sorts. But we also need to be, examine information production at its most granular levels at the point where individual information workers are creating, processing, and distributing the information products that are important to an organization. As you know from your own experience, as well from this intricate workflow diagram, business tasks or processes and information production can become extremely technical and intricate. To provide methods for communicating organizational procedures and frameworks, with which we can understand how to make information more efficient, we need to be able to both visualize work processes and model them. This is where workflow analysis and business process management can help us. Now in the first part of this lecture, we'll cover the basics of how to create flowchart flow chart type workflow and business process diagrams. In the second part of the lecture, we'll talk about some introductory analysis and process improvement methods you can use to develop and analyze workflows in your own organizations. First, uh, before you start the assignment um, for this week, you'll need to select a flowcharting application. Now, you can use the same tool you selected for the information lifecycle model assignment or use something different. I believe Leah mentioned she wanted to use a mind mapping tool called CMAP for her ILM assignment. And that's perfectly fine. You can use any tool. Just be sure that the application you select has a library of standardized workflow diagram shapes like that shown here on the slide. By the way, this is the application window for that open source application I mentioned in our last learning module called DIA. And you can see here on the, let me get my pen up here, you can see here on the left menu bar that there is a library of standard flowchart shapes that DIA provides and that's the important part for the exercises that you will need uh, for the assignment. Now there's a few rules of etiquette we need to follow when constructing a flowchart diagram. Uh, first, the uh, drawing should start on the left and progress to the right. If you are uh, diagramming a simple workflow process, it's generally best to start at the left center and design your diagram to flow 
straight across to the right uh, across the diagram page. If you have a more complicated diagram that has a lot of sub-processes and additional steps in it, then you might want to start at the top left corner and design your diagram to flow down to the bottom right corner. This was, produces what's called a waterfall diagram that has kind of a step look to it like that. These are some basic ISO workflow shapes that were originally designed by IBM and NASA in the 1950s and 60s. It's funny, they were originally designed to document manual workflow processes and computer workflows that required a lot of manual intervention, such as the loading of punch cards or magnetic tape reels before you could run a computer program. Still, they are perfectly functional today with, and with a little bit of modification and redefinition, we can continue to use them uh, in a way that uh, reflects our contemporary needs. Here's a more intricate set of flowchart symbols that can add some sophistication to your diagram. Here, for example, is the symbol for beginning or ending. I've just got it marked as terminate workflow, but you can certainly use this uh, symbol to start a workflow process and show the end also. Sometimes when you have a very intricate workflow, uh, it will spread over several pages. And so you can use these connector symbols to help you jump from one page to another or from one main workflow process to another on a series of diagrams. The symbols on the left indicate um, some basic functions. Uh, there's the document function. This could be a paper document or an electronic document like a word processing file or an email. Stored data, we don't really use this symbol anymore that much. Uh, it's preferred to use the database symbol that looks like a cylinder on its side. Um, if you need to indicate that there's output displayed to a computer screen, you can use this symbol. And this is a nice symbol for the submission of a request. So if somebody isn't just simply uh, preparing a document, but they're actually submitting a request, uh, this is a good way to delineate that. And then the decision symbol can be very important throughout uh, your workflow diagrams. Um, decision usually has one in point and then can have multiple out points based on uh, evaluative choices that happen during the workflow. So we'll, we'll examine how this is used in more detail a little later on in the uh, lecture. Just jumping back uh, real quick, I wanted to just mention a couple of these um, original ISO workflow shapes. Uh, for example, I use in uh, my own workflow diagrams uh, these message symbols quite frequently to show when information comes back to a user or when a user sends information. Uh, the preparation symbol can be very useful also to show that there's some lead time that you need before starting an actual process. So if you have to gather materials or information together uh, before you can actually start working on a task, uh, this is a good symbol to use to indicate that. Any general process from data entry to uh, data processing, uh, reformatting, uh, working with the database, etc., can be represented by this generic uh, process symbol. If the process has been predefined as a specific type of function, so you're going to see it again and again, and it's a standard procedure. So, um, for example, a defined process would be in my email inbox, 
uh, when I uh, mark an email with a red flag to show that it's important. Um, if I'm going to have that option throughout a workflow process, then you might want to indicate that as a defined process. Um, here's a sort of pseudo keyboard symbol that shows the data is being input manually. If some other kind of manual process, say collating a file or uh, right hand writing uh, information on a document uh, is called for in a workflow, you can use that one instead. When data is transmitted, sent, or received, you can use the data symbol here. Now, these are just some examples of the flowchart symbols that you will find predefined for you in uh, Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint. And I think, as I mentioned in the last learning module, that's perfectly fine to use uh, Word as your flowcharting tool. Um, you can use these um, on the, I believe they're on the insert menu and then they're under the um, uh, insert special characters or special shapes uh, submenus. Oh, I should also mention that it's perfectly fine also to create your own flowchart shapes to represent a special situation, process, or task. Just be sure that you uh, first um, document what that special shape means for those people who aren't going to be familiar with it. And that's usually done by putting a legend in one corner of your diagram and identifying what that special shape means. Um, it's also fine as long as you use it consistently for the same type of process you know, throughout all of your diagrams. Labels on a, a, any workflow analysis or business process uh, diagram are very important for clarification. Uh, the shapes need to be uh, labeled uh, so that people know specifically uh, what resources or activities you're talking about. Um, you also often need general annotations on the chart that um, talk about what is going on within a particular process. Now you should use as, as many annotations as needed to clearly communicate your analysis uh, diagram, but you don't need to um, annotate every single uh, process that occurs. A lot of the processes will sort of be self, become self-evident to those who are reading a diagram if it's constructed properly. Here, where the, you use the decision symbol and it branches into two or more uh, different sub-processes, um, you need to label the actual line of um, egress from the decision symbol into the subprocess. So in this case, our decision is, does this report need further annotation? If the answer is no, then the file is sent, the report file is sent to the file archive. And if the answer is yes, it needs annotation, then we send the report for further approval. Now, two is about as much as you can logically show um, as options coming from a decision point symbol. Um, you can, in certain circumstances, offer more than two options based on specific criteria. But the criteria, like yes and no here, need to be labeled uh, clearly for the user. Connecting lines are also important. They show the flow of work process and end information uh, th from one end, from the starting point in the uh, diagram until the ending point. Uh, usually you want to use solid black lines with arrows that point in the direction of flow uh, throughout your diagram 
for very complex diagrams, sometimes you can use different colored uh, arrowed lines to indicate large, sort of large di um, divergences from the main uh, workflow branch. And if there's an alternate type of flow uh, input or output uh, that comes into the diagram, then that can be indicated with a dotted line, uh, which would mean an, it's an optional input or output. Color can be important as well, but you should use color sparingly on an analysis document. You typically want to color each type of shape a certain color, although there are occasions where you might want to group all of the shapes for one specific task and make them all one color uh, to show that they are in a group that's related to themselves there. Here's a very simple and funny and kind of wry uh, flowchart example. Um, here we have our start and end points. They used a circle instead of that lozenge or capsule shaped um, shape that I showed you earlier. But this is a simple workflow that has one sub-process that shows how to um, hit the snooze alarm in the morning when your alarm clock goes off. So we go from start point here, the alarm rings, the decision point is are we ready to get up? If the answer is no, you hit the snooze button and there's a delay and the delay is this D kind of shape. There's a delay and the annotation is set the delay for five minutes. And then the sub-process rejoins the main um, workflow process um, in progress, and the alarm will ring again. Um, if we're ready to get up the second time around, then we go to the, the step where we climb out of bed and the uh, routine ends. So using just three or four different types of shapes, um, we've we have seen how this diagram uh, communicates a rather complicated uh, possible set of actions um, and pretty effectively too. Now here's a much more complicated flow chart that shows the hiring process at a company uh, from the human resources standpoint. And where we enter the workflow is we identify a staffing need. Um, and then where the process ends is when a temp employee or a permanent employee is hired. Now note the decision points that are um, embedded throughout the workflow process. Each one of them has just uh, one input and two outputs, and the outputs are yes and no. And so each of these decision points creates a branch in the workflow that needs to resolve itself and then rejoin the main um, workflow uh, branch until the uh, process is resolved, either by hiring one or of two different types of candidates. Now this is a more sophisticated type of flowchart called a cross-functional flowchart. And this allows us to describe very detailed workflows that are divided between and where the workflow responsibilities are divided between either individuals or between groups of individuals like departments or work groups. So in the cross-functional flowchart, 
each group or individual is represented by a single bar. Usually you see a horizontal bar. Sometimes you'll see uh, cross-functional flowcharts that have vertical bars, which are simply turned uh, over on their head where this becomes the top of the, um, the diagram area. Now, we use uh, this type of cross-functional diagram when more than one person or more than one team is required to fulfill a particular task. It can also indicate when more than one person or more than one team is dependent, dependent upon each other. Uh, so if I need to get information or approval from another department before I can complete a task that makes me dependent on them. Um, so these dependencies and the um, shared status of the workflow are shown when the arrows between steps cross over the boundary lines of these uh, rectangular bars. This is what's called a handoff in workflow speak. So from the tester group or individual here, uh, if this decision is no, then the tester hands off the work to the technical support group, who then may hand it back off to the tester again. Um, handoffs are an area that we'll see that um, so a lot of times they are certainly necessary, but if you have too many handoffs, then that can definitely uh, cause a great deal of inefficiency and slow your workflow processing down uh, because oftentimes if this person is being handed off to and they are either busy or they're gone for the day, uh, then it, you, instead of having a handoff here, you create a queue or a waiting line of requests. And that definitely will slow down the uh, speed and efficiency of any workflow process. Here are the basic components of a cross-functional flowchart. Usually you see a title at the top. Um, the workflow can be divided into these phases, which create another type of boundary between different types of tasks. And then each one of these rectangular bars um, is defining a, the work that is under the responsibility of a person or a group that's separate from the others. And um, typically, like I said, it's usually a department or an individual that's represented by the uh, rectangular bars. This bar in popular terminology is called a swim lane because they kind of look like the swim lanes you see at big Olympic size uh, swimming pools where uh, swimming competitions are held. Let's move now to talk about how to do a basic uh, business process analysis and break a task into its component functions and parts. Now, in your um, further reading section online in your learning module, there are several books that I listed that will go into different theories of workflow analysis and business process management and different methodologies for um, diagramming and visualizing and modeling workflow processes. Since we have limited time available to us, we're going to stick with this basic uh, analysis method, which you will find is going to be good enough for most of the different kinds of analysis that you need to do. Um, there are six steps in this basic analysis. And the first step is 
before you start creating your diagram is we need to uh, define some parameters about the workflow task that you're analyzing. So the first thing we do is define the outcome. What does the task accomplish? So that could be like we'll see in a moment, um, we'll do a diagram of sending an email. Well, the outcome of that is simply that the email is transmitted. We could make the outcome to be that the communication, the email that we sent is received and read by the person at the other line, which would be a different kind of outcome. So we need to very concisely define what outcome we want uh, to show as the, par the main parameter in which the task that we're analyzing occurs. The second is we need to define the boundaries of each task both the beginning and end of the larger task itself, like sending an email. And then also we need to define the boundaries of each of the individual components, main components of the uh, task, which we'll do in a second when we get to listing uh, activities. Identify the participants. Now there's some, there's some lack of consensus on whether or not you really in workflow analysis want to define individual positions, but <clears throat> there, and there are some theories that say you should only follow the, um, the work process in a workflow diagram. There are others that we, where we can say we only want to look at the flow of information through a task. Uh, and then there's others where we want to actually identify the individual workers who are um, accomplishing a task. Each is fine in its own right, but just be aware that identifying participants may not be appropriate in every situation where you're trying to do a workflow analysis. Um, the fourth step is to identify all of the activities that make up the task. So all of the small component steps that uh, comprise the task. And you might need to make three or four drafts of your workflow diagram before you really identify all of the activities that go into um, the analysis. It's also important to do, identify tools and information systems, software packages, or manual kind of aids that are used in accomplishing a task. So for example, if somebody um, needs to pick up a hand calculator during a workflow task, that you need to identify the, cal the calculator as an external tool that they need to do their job or if they need to write something down on a piece of paper, then take it over to another desk where they look something up on the computer. There's a whole set of tools that you might need to identify there. So paper, pencil, um, computer interface, etc. cetera. Um, especially when you start working with large, complicated information systems that do a whole lot of different things, so for example, any of you who work here at uh, University of New Mexico know that we have the Banner Financial Management System, um, which solves a number of different student information management and financial management uh, functions for the university. So in th that case, it's not simply enough to identify that Banner is a tool that's used in a workflow here at the university. We need to know what modules in Banner you're using. Are you using a financial input, student data input form? Are you using a reporting tool? Are you using a financial transaction tool? Also, what features within a complex module? Um, so if you're using a calculator feature um, or if you are using and sending a, you know, a feature that sends an email or processes a document or uploads a file, you need to identify all of those as tools and, and system components that are needed for the task that you're analyzing. And finally, you need to identify the channels. And when we mean channels, we just mean the flow of information and work 
that moves through the task and connects the different steps together so that the task can be completed. Now often the, the channel the channels include things like user input, machine output, like if a machine send, you know, pops up a window that gives you a warning. Um, it can be manual uh, transfer, like if, you, if I'm taking data on a flash drive from one point in the workflow to another, and I do that manually, that's a separate type of channel. You can think of channels as the arrow lines that connect the different workflow shapes on the diagram. And if you have extremely variegated types of uh, channels, that's the time when you might want to create separate colors for each major channel so that you can identify specific types of information and workflow through a task. So let's do a simple analysis exercise using the six uh, step analysis method that I just talked about. And if we're going to create a workflow analysis diagram of how we send an email, and I'm going to skip over just for time's sake, and, um, I think you all probably get this uh, pretty easily. So um, I'm going to skip over some of the detail that you would normally go into um, just so that I don't make this so tedious that you all get bored to death uh, before the end of the lecture. So, our first step is we want to define the outcome. And we're going to define our outcome as an email message has been transmitted from my workstation. And we're assuming it goes somewhere else, but we're not going to worry about whether it successfully arrives or whether anybody reads it on the other end. So we're, here we're defining a major boundary for what we are going to be analyzing. And that's important to break down uh, a, a complex workflow uh, by first defining its boundaries so that you don't get caught up in maybe bringing in additional um, components that uh, may not be the main, the primary concern of the workflow. The second is, um, we need to set our boundary limits for the workflow. So we're going to define our start and our end boundaries. The start boundary is that the user conceives that he, need, he or she needs to send an email message. The ending boundary is that outcome, is the completed mail is transmitted or sent. We only have one single user, so we don't need a cross-functional workflow chart because we don't really have, we're not going to include multiple uh, individuals in this analysis. Next, we're going to define all of the activities that the user has to uh, accomplish in order to send the email. And that includes everything from opening your email application to opening the blank email form looking up or typing in an email address, writing a subject, writing the body of the email, inserting your subject line. That may be a manual process or it may be an automatic process. Uh, quality checking the email for spelling or grammar mistakes, uh, making sure that your email is communicating the message that you want to send, and then clicking the send button to actually transmit the email. We're only going to use one tool, which we're going to assume is like Microsoft Outlook or Hotmail or um, Gmail uh, web interface or something like that. And I've identified the main sub-features of that application that we will include in the form. So there's the actual email form, there's the address book feature, and the spell check feature. Now, what are they, our channels of flow in the uh, analysis here? Well, manual data entry, the user has to use the computer to type up their message. Uh, 
if, for example, they already had a message that they had put into a Word document and were just going to use copy and paste, that would be another type of channel that we would possibly, not always, but possibly need to consider. Another channel would be a communication channel where the uh, email application gives feedback to the user. That's often important to include on workflow diagrams to show uh, that um, the user is being told that something is either going okay or something is an error or something needs to be fixed or another step is required. And then the actual email transmission, which we don't need to actually represent on the uh, diagram because it's simply um, not part of our overall outcome parameter for the workflow analysis. So now we'll take our analysis write-up that we did and start creating our diagram. So here's our um, initial outcome that's been defined here. And our boundaries are that the user starts the process by conceiving that they need to write an email and that the end of the process is when the email is sent. So that's numbers one and two in the uh, analysis um, checklist. Now in this diagram, you see I've added the activities, most of them. I think I left a couple out just for the sake of space. But the major activities that need to be uh, accomplished for the email to be sent. Now we have three general processes opening the email application, writing the email, and sending the email. And we have one decision point here, spell check, represented by the diamond shape. Now I've organized my workflow logically into a waterfall um, configuration that flows from the top left of the diagram to the bottom right. And all of the steps are in proper order here. Now I've added some color and I've added my um, connecting lines between the shapes. I indicate start with green, end with red, all of the general processes are light blue and then I've highlighted the um, decision point here and I've added um, flow connectors for each possible outcome of the decision point and labeled them properly yes or no so that whoever's reading the diagram will understand it and I've created a very small sub-process here where if I write the email and then I hit the spell check button, if the spell check is not all correct, doesn't find that the email is all uh, grammatically and correct in terms of spelling, then I get a no answer that sends me back into the writing email phase and then I correct my mistake and I come back to spell check. Once I spell check correctly and I get a yes response, then I can move on to the next step of clicking the send button and having the email sent. So once you have been able to diagram, you know, identify all the parts of a task and diagram them using that six point method that we just covered, um, the next step is to try to improve the workflow so it runs more efficiently or runs faster. Um, and there's a number of different um, signs that we can look for in the diagram that indicate places where we might want to try to reorganize the workflow. Uh, to make it more efficient. So the first item here is to minimize the number of decision points in your workflow. 
a workflow that has a whole bunch of decision points is going to get bogged down at some point because somebody has to evaluate what's going on in the workflow at every one of those decision points. Now, sometimes that can't be avoided, but that's an area where you can look at to see if you can maybe eliminate or combine some of those decision points to make the workflow process run more efficiently or faster. Minimize the number of handoffs between people or departments or groups of people in the workflow. A handoff always causes a slowdown of work, usually because the person you're handing off to isn't just sitting there waiting with nothing else to do. You're usually handing off to somebody who's already busy doing another task and so the, the handoff causes a backlog or a, a waiting line or a queue of uh, pending um, work to do that um, is going to cause the rest of the system to back up uh, before um, it's cleared and the person gets caught up with all their work and the, the workflow is able to uh, start functioning normally again. So if you can minimize handoffs uh, as much as possible, then it will cause more efficiency in a workflow, generally speaking. Uh, minimize the number of quality checks or approvals. Whenever you have to stop and examine work to see if it's correct, complete and correct, or if you have to have somebody in authority approve the work before it can go on, sometimes those are important uh, gate keeping functions in a workflow and sometimes uh, they simply slow things down. So if you can combine uh, quality checking and approvals into one step or as few steps as possible, um, that again will help speed efficiency in a workflow. Uh, managing queues and bottlenecks. You know, when as I mentioned, when work is handed off, it often creates a, a bottleneck effect where um, the person on the other end who's receiving the work handoff um, is only able to process, you know, one request at a time. And often that causes a whole slowdown in the whole workflow system. So one of the um, solutions to managing uh, queues and, and bottlenecks created by handoffs is to add multiple individuals who can be handed off to, um, who can, uh, you know, accept new work requests and therefore uh, eliminate the bottleneck effect. The other thing you can do if that's not possible to add capacity is to simplify the processes um, so that the person who is being handed off to can finish their part of the task and then pass on the work as quickly as possible. And then there's a lot of things that, you know, we haven't talked about in terms of workflow efficiency, which are not going to be able to be represented on the workflow diagram. There are things that you could make notes about, but you can't really uh, show or demonstrate them in uh, a visualization or a modeling system. So uh, documentation for people who are engaged in a workflow will always in, you know, improve efficiency. If we give them good instructions and we give them good training, that will improve efficiency. Um, improving the user friendliness of the tools and systems that people have to use. So if you've got um, you know, a person in, who's in the, a workflow um, line that uh, needs to do data entry into a database, but the database data entry form is so poorly designed that it takes them twice as long as if they had just been able to you know, type into a word processing document, that's going to cause uh, work slowdown and inefficiency. So, Creating software and physical tools and systems that are user-friendly and efficient is highly important to workflow efficiency. 
and then often more automation and less human intervention so if something can be automated uh, to where you can have a program written to perform a task that a person doesn't really need to be performing um, that will also improve efficiency and there are a whole host any number of off chart uh, types of issues such as morale um, you know the type of people you're hiring uh, the type of physical work environment you're in all kinds of things and so that's almost an infinite list but really since we're trying to focus on making the workflow work as efficiently as possible we should only include examination of off chart issues that are we are going to directly impact the uh, workflow efficiency. All right, let's wrap up. Um, for module four, um, you've got the following tasks to accomplish and all of the assignments are due by uh, next midnight, next Tuesday, that's uh, September 23rd. So you have the online learning module, which you've already seen with the introductory remarks that I, I wrote, and then this online lecture, of course. Um, I've got four easy to read chapters with lots of diagrams uh, from uh, Robert uh, DeMilio's book, The Basics of Processing, Process Mapping. He's not the most, um, fluid of writers but he knows his subject well um, so be prepared that his writing style is a little bit quirky and he sounds like an uh, you know a management consultant which he is um, but I like his book because it um, is very concise and gets through a lot of material quickly so just bear with the, the reading assignment um, you've got a tools and methods assignment to design a flow chart that represents one stage of your information lifecycle model. And I have extensive instructions online for you. But <clears throat> we all, <clears throat> in our, your last assignment, you all created an information lifecycle model that had multiple steps. And it should at least have four and hopefully a lot more steps um, that shows the overall organizational flow of information within whatever context you picked for it. I want you to take one of those stages, say the creation stage or the active use stage or the semi-active use stage or the uh, final, uh, final action phase, whatever stage you want, and break that down into its component workflow parts. Now, if, if the life cycle model you built was for a huge organization and there's going to be dozens of individual workflows that are very complicated for each stage in the life cycle, you can just choose one workflow um, to analyze. But I want you to do the six point analysis that I just showed you and design a flow chart that represents the workflow steps contained in one of those stages in your life cycle model. Once you've done that and turned in your flow chart assignment, um, there's a discussion assignment with three different threads and I'd like you to post a short answer to each of those threads. And if possible, um, get into an online discussion with your um, classmates uh, to talk about your experience designing a flowchart and whether you were able to see any efficiencies that could be gained in the workflow that you diagrammed and analyzed. And then I have some very good further reading. There's two books that are on that are ebooks on uh, books books 24 seven, which is one of the subscription services that UNM Libraries has. If you don't have a books 24 seven user account. You just need to create one with your UNM uh, email address. It's free and all they ask you to do is put your email and your password in and then you'll have full access to the Books24 library. And then I've given you links and uh, the titles of each of those books and, and indicated which chapters are 
most salient to the learning module. So that's it. If you have questions or need help, uh, email, call, or stop by my office. And other than that, have a great week, and thank you.